for it TV. The world is thinking. I'm Jewel Gomez, author, activist, and a member of the club's California Book Awards jury. Tonight's program is a good lit event, generously underwritten by the Bernard Osher Foundation. It's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Nuruddin Farah, Somali writer whose most recent uh, trilogy includes sardines, closed sesame, and sweet and sour milk, and his newest book, The Beginning of Another Trilogy, I imagine, is called Knots. Um, in the book, The Gift, there is a line that says, all stories celebrate in elegiac terms the untapped sources and, and of energy of the humanness of women and men. This celebration of life force and humanity is at the heart of the books of our guest. Born in 1945 in Italian and British rule Somaliland, he has become a world traveler. He's a writer almost by birthright because his father worked as a translator for the British and his mother is a poet who wrote a poem for the birth of each of her 10 children. Somalia gained independence in 1960, but has remained in internal conflict for decades. Farah studied literature and philosophy at university in India before returning to Somalia to teach in Mugadashu. His first novel, From a Crooked Rib, was published in 1970 and told the story of a young girl who flees her family to avoid the arranged marriage to a man 40 years her senior. When his second novel, A Naked Needle, was published in 1976, it explored the crisis of Somalian identity allegorically and suggests that political independence has not meant complete independence for Somali women. His exploration must have been a success because his books were banned by the regime that was in power. Thus began a life of teaching for Nuradin Farah in the US, Germany, Italy, Nigeria, Sudan, Gambia, and India. After an exile of 22 years, he returned to his homeland, but eventually settled in Cape Town, South Africa. His work has been called Dense Bewildering Forests. His characters described as queenly, dynamic, unyielding, fascinating, complex. And he has been described as one of the most sophisticated voices in modern fiction. He was the first African to be named a Neustadt International Laureate, an honor previously bestowed on writers such as Octavio Paz and Gabriel Garcia Marquez. His writing opens a new door into gender, sexuality, and identity in Islamic society. As he keeps up with his task, he set for himself, keeping his country alive by writing about it. Please welcome Nuruddin Farah. Thank you so much for being with us here today. And I do have to ask, did your mother actually write a poem for each one of her children? Well, she, uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. The first time that I'm at the Commonwealth Club, I've often come to San Francisco, one of the cities I love most, but I haven't been here for a very long time. And with a friend yesterday evening, we went and visited some of the scenes that I used to remember, you know, uh, in the late 1970s. Yeah. Thank you anyway. Uh, the question, your question was, did my mother write a poem? Um, well, in Somali, you see, there are, in classical Somali poetry, there are two types of poetry. One is the female genre of poetry, which is called burambur. And then there is the male genre of poetry, which is called gabay. And then the gabay could be, poetry could be divided, classical poetry could be divided into many different forms of which even women take part. But mainly, men do not take part in the female genre of poetry, the burambur. 
And my mother used to compose poetry in the Burambur tradition. And every child who was born, at least the first few, <laughs> until the children became too many, and naturally required, you know, too many, well, the demands were too far too many that she actually stopped composing poetry altogether, except for the occasional poem whenever she composed. My theory, um, not proven yet, but I think many, <coughs> many women would agree with me. My theory is that if my mother had as much time as my dad did to engage in politics, she would probably have become a major poet. But because women are overworked, overworked to the extent where they don't know day from, from night, uh, many of them cannot aspire to becoming writers, to becoming full-fledged poets, and so on and so forth. And this is, you know, the daily life. If you, if you just consider the daily, the amount of time that women put into running the home, unacknowledged, and so on and so forth. So, so that's a very long answer to a very short question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I found it very touching, the idea of the mother writing the poems for her children, uh, particularly with the understanding of all of the work that it takes to have that many children in a nation that is, is poor and in, in, in uh, tumult, you know. But we, we went always in turmoil. I mean, the turmoil is recent. Uh, I. I'm not that ancient, I believe, but I mean, I, I, I have memories of very, very pleasant days in Mogadishu. I have very, very many pleasant days. Um, and the way, not that I'm justifying it, but the way I often say is that, uh, you know, you've had your civil war several hundred years ago, mm. or 100, 200, however many years ago. We are having ours now. You know, not all children grow in the same, at the same rate, the same pace. Some grow a bit slower, some come later, you know, some, some do very well early on and then they begin to falter later. So maybe we, we, are, we are late developers. Well, so what? I mean, it's, it's, it's always good to fight, we say in Somali, so that we get to know each other. So we're doing a fight. <laughs> But the, the independence after colonialism can't, can't be an easy thing, I think. But I wonder of the relationship between uh, the Somalian people and the British and Italians. Is there still any collaboration or connection? Well, you know, a couple that have had children, if you take a couple that have had children, and that have even had uh, a very nasty divorce situation, because children join them, they, whether they like it or not, <laughs> they're, they're bound to each other, and uh, they have to somehow coexist, cohab, you know, that sort of thing. And therefore, the colonialists and the colonized have this, this kind of symbiotic, uh, ambiguous relationship. Not all of it healthy, not all of it healthy, but the, the relationship between Somalia, the Italians, the British still continues, um, ironically enough. I am lucky enough to have been born in the then Italian Somaliland and was brought up in Ethiopia where I went to school and then went back to live in Mogadishu to finish my high school. So I'm one of those who benefited from colonialism in inverted commas benefited because I've had the opportunity to learn a number of languages, uh, you know, something like six, seven mm. languages. Uh, and I usually say, when people say to me, why do you speak so many languages? Or why do you, why have you written in so many languages? I always say, because I've been colonized many times. <laughs> uh, naturally, it isn't easy to be colonized. But then once you discover your own freedom and then use it to its full benefit, 
its full advantage, then there's a lot to be gained because the experience of having been through colonialism uh, prepares you for coup d'etat, you know, the take military takeovers, for problems that occur, and so on and so forth. In, in your writing, you can see a clear love for the land and the people, the textures of the language, uh, the evocation of the smells even, and, and the sound of the call to prayer. All of these things are very, very evocative. Um, and I wonder, in moving away, living an almost nomadic life, how that affected your writing about your country. What did you miss most about being at home? Well, I would say that there have been many benefits, many more benefits being away from Somalia than disadvantages. Uh, the, the most important of which, the most important of which consists of the fact that if I had lived on in Somalia, I don't think my mother, my parents, my brothers and sisters would have allowed me to write the way I did because they were breathing down my neck even as when I lived as far away as possible in Rome or in England or Germany or somewhere else. And the reason is because they were always reminding me, they were always reminding me, why are you taking on this responsibility? Why are you sticking your neck out? What is it that's so special about you? Why can't you just be like anybody else? And that, obviously, if I had lived close by to them, would have been much more pronounced. Um, my father and I had difficulties being in the same room for <laughs> half an hour without getting into a quarrel. Uh, my mother never stopped. Uh, uh, advising me to be cautious because she always said, you know, uh, I love you and I don't want to lose you. But, you know, that, that obviously meant that you couldn't write. In addition to this, my brothers and sisters, and as I said to you, we started off, you know, with 12 children. As we say in Somali, the, the, there is an Irish expression in English, we are 10, three living. In other mm. words, you start off with 10 and then seven die along the way and then seven living. Now in Somalia, we have something similar. We say we are 12, eight living. In other words, you know, people die along the way. It's not, um, you know, 21st century medicine is not available to everyone. Um, many of us do not reach pensionable, pensionable age. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the life expectancy in, in Somalia would be around 47. So it's a miracle that I'm still alive right now, <laughs> <laughs> sitting, <laughs> sitting in, in San Francisco and talking to you. It's a miracle. I mean, it's not, it's not one of those things that happen. I'm a, I am the classical example of medicine walking, probably. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm healthy, but... And therefore, I forgot. The, <laughs> the, the, the effect on your writing of, of living a nomadic life. So it, it, I actually did benefit a great deal from being away for the, for the simple fact that when you move away from the spot of the ground you're standing on, you can see it better. And for the simple reason that also distance distills you can see clearly the, the, the images, the pictures, much more clearly mm -hmm. when you are away from it. Uh, and when my mother wasn't breathing down my neck or my dad wasn't telling me off or my brother wasn't reminding me, you know, I'm going to lose my job, which they did. They all lost their jobs, every single one of them. And they blamed me for it for years and years. And I said, I don't accept any nonsense. Mm -hmm. Many Somalis lost their lives and their jobs.